chaos into creation. The Spirit is moving, sisters and brothers, taking away our hearts of stone. The Spirit is moving, parting the waters, leading us out of the kingdom of sorrow. sons and daughters, turning our darkness into dawn. merciful kingdom the spirit is moving breath of the father one with the savior making us one we will walk together in the light. 
morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Welcome to Trinity Sunday. Let's uh, stand and prepare our hearts to worship together. service begins on page 123 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be his people now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the call for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Please join me in singing the Gloria.
pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who is with the Son and the Holy Spirit, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Before we are seated for the reading of God's word, I'd like to pray for our children. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the joy and care of children. Give us calm strength and patient wisdom so to train them that they may love all that is true and pure and lovely and of good report following the example of their Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. Now Moses was keep oh sorry, a reading from the book of Exodus. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see a great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Well, we invite you to stand again for the psalm. The psalm appointed for... Trinity Sunday is Psalm 93. We will sing this refrain, uh, simply titled, Our God Reigns, um, and then we'll read the verses responsively. Uh, Father James will lead us, and he'll read up to the asterisk, and then uh, the rest of us, we can respond with the remainder of the verse, and then we'll go back to the chorus of this refrain. Here it is. Our God
stronger than the sea. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Stronger than the brokenness inside of me. Let's sing it together. Our God is king and has put on glorious apparel. The Lord has put on his apparel and girded himself with strength. He has made the round world so sure that it cannot be moved. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. You are crowned in last. Our God. Floods have risen, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their waves. Mightier than the sound of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord dwells on high and is mightier. Your testimonies, O Lord, are very sure. Holiness is the Lord's house for Our God reigns, our God reigns, stronger than the chaos, stronger than the sea. Our God reigns, our God reigns, stronger than the brokenness inside. Inside of me. And you may be seated. Second reading is from the book of Romans. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh. Uh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. One more time, let's stand again as we're able. Let's okay. sing to the Holy Spirit. As we'll sing Veni Sancti Spiritus. Spirit, Lord of light, from thy clear celestial height, thy pure beaming radiance give. Come now, Father of the poor, come with treasures which endure. 
Sorry about that, I got so excited about that song, I forgot to come down here and read y'all the gospel, but this is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Christ. Our reading today comes from John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. 
you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with the, everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet do, you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent us your Son, and your spirit and revealing yourself to be a triune God. We ask, Lord, that in this time, in the preaching of your word, that through my words, you would reveal yourself as a triune God uh, in a way that makes our hearts sing and see how glorified you are. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated while I go get this podium. My name is Michael, and I'm one of the, the pastors here. It's good to be with y'all this morning. Uh, and uh, I am not the head pastor here, or the rector, that is Alex, as y'all probably know. And one of the reasons why he is not preaching this morning is because his youngest daughter, the last of his children to get married, was married yesterday. And Alex is a wise man, he's a clever man. So he might say he chose this date because it was when the venue was available or it was the best for his family schedule. But I suspect, I suspect he also chose this date because he knew it was gonna be Trinity Sunday. And he didn't wanna preach on the Trinity because as we all know, the, the Trinity is kind of complex. This idea that God is three in one and one in three. And so on, on Trinity Sunday, each year we have a moment to reflect on the Trinity. And that shouldn't be a challenging thing because the Trinity gets at the very heart of who God is. And so every week we should be talking about who God is, which must touch on how God is triune. But if we're honest when we think about God being triune or God being three in one, it's kind of complicated because for most of us, it seems to defy the rules of logic. And so if you're a Christian this morning or if you're trying to figure out things of faith, maybe that's you, you hear the Trinity and you think, that just does not make sense and I kind of have an issue with that. So that may be you this morning, but there's another, I would say, actually a deeper issue, a deeper problem that lots of us have when we think about the Trinity. And that is it might to us seem like a dry, dead doctrine instead of something that makes our soul sing. And that is a much deeper problem than not being able to understand it, right? Because if the gospel is good news and God is the author of this good news and God at his heart is triune, shouldn't the Trinity also be good news? Shouldn't this be also something that provides us with deep in, in encouragement. But if you're like me, sometimes it might just seem like an abstraction and we don't know how it relates to our life. So those are the two big questions that we have before us today. One, how can we believe that the Trinity is true? How can we believe it to be true? And two, how can we behold it to be beautiful? And in response to those questions, I I uh, have put forward for us this morning kind of a classic saying on the Trinity. And the idea of this is the Trinity is not a maxim to be explained, but a mystery to be experienced. The Trinity is not a maxim to be explained, 
but a mystery to be experienced. So what do we mean by that first part, that the Trinity is not a maxim to be, uh, to be explained? Uh, well, we know that it's hard to explain the Trinity. It gets confusing super quickly, and we uh, see the evidence of that in our gospel to today, at least the elements of, of the Trinity. We see Jesus, the Son, is talking about God the Father and making reference to the Spirit. So we see these three kind of persons that all exist. And Paul talks to that as well in the epistle that we read this morning too. He talks about being in Christ. He talks about the work of the Spirit. And he talks about us crying Father. So again, we see these kind of three elements of, of the Trinity. If you're a, a theologian, don't be upset by me calling that an element. It's just a figure of speech. Uh, but it gets to this idea that the early church fathers fought hard to try and establish, which is that these three persons are all God. That the Son is God, the Father is God, and the Spirit is God. But God is not the Son, and the Son is not God. And the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not, sorry, God is not the the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son, etc., etc. You get the idea. But the issue is that if we're honest, oftentimes we don't get the idea because it seems to violate our rules of logic. It goes against the transitive property. The idea that if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. But the Trinity says that's not so. So it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Put another way, in the Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one. And this makes it really hard to understand. And if, if I took classes on the Trinity in, in, in seminary and they were the most confusing books I read in my entire life. And if you would ever like to read a book that gets into this, in a way that's easy to understand, and in a way that actually presents the Trinity as beautiful, I would recommend a book to you called The Lighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. But as we think about this one plus one plus one e e equals one, it's hard for us to understand, and so oftentimes we try to have an analogy to try and explain it. But what the theologians will all say is these analogies at some point break down into something that becomes heretical. And so well established is in this in theological circles is that someone made a video that you can go watch on YouTube if you Google St. Patrick bad analogies. It's very funny. Um, and so the Trinity is something that can't be explained because we can't explain it. So how can that be? I can't explain the Trinity, but I can explain that we can't explain the Trinity, if that makes sense. So if something is easy, we might say, well, it's not rocket science. And we say that because we know that rocket science is super complex and complicated. It's not easy to understand. And so if we know that rocket science is so hard to grasp, how much more ought it be the case that the God who created the universe, the cosmos, the universal constants that underlie the science of ro rocket science, how much more would he be complicated and complex and hard for us to understand? It would make sense that we can't entirely make sense of God and, and the Trinity. And this is something that a Catholic theologian named Herbert McCabe put very well using a similar analogy of science. He said, there is nothing especially odd or irrational about God or the doctrine of the Trinity. It only seems shocking to those who expect the study of God to be easy and obvious, a less demanding discipline than, say, the study of nuclear physics. And so we shouldn't expect the Trinity to be easily understood because if other things in the world are so complex, why should the God who made the world not also be complex? And so that's the first part, why the Trinity is a maxim that we can't explain or a maxim that should not be explained. Instead, we should say that it's a mystery to be experienced. But the way, the reason why we even know that the Trinity exists in the, in the first place uh, is something that we can continue with this metaphor of science. So if we say God is so incomprehensible that we can't understand him, 
it would be easy to say, well then how do we know he's th three and one? Or how do we know he's one and, and three? And the, the analogy of science can continue to help us with that. So scientists revise their theories when they're exposed to new data that their old theories don't make sense of. And that is exactly what happened with Jesus. God entered into our world, and in doing so, he rocked our world. Colossians says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It says that Jesus is our definitive source to knowing who God is. So to continue with the science idea, Christ's life gave us data about what God is like, data that we never had access to before. And so we had to revise our understanding about who God was to make more sense of it. And that's why we see Nicodemus in our gospel passage, the teacher of Israel, if anyone knows his scripture and his theology, it's gonna be him. And yet he's at a loss to understand what Jesus is talking about in terms of what the Son and the Father and Spirit are doing because Jesus is revealing this new data about who God is that doesn't fit into his categories. And in a way, that's also what we see in our psalm today. We read how in the psalm, God is king over all. The waves rebel against him in chaos, but he subdues the waves. And uh, Jews before the time of Jesus would have read that and thought, surely this is talking about God, the creator of all, the one God. And yet we see Jesus who talks about God the Father as if he's not exactly the same as him the Son. And we see Jesus announcing the kingdom of God demonstrating that he is king and subduing the waves, calming the storm, walking on the waves to show that he is king. And so even that psalm itself, as we look at the life of Jesus, we see that God cannot just be one. God is th three in one, as we see in Jesus, but it's hard for us to understand. And that's why the Trinity Sunday falls when it does, because we look back on the events of the liturgical year preceding us. We look back on Advent when we meditate on how God the Father promised a redeemer to the Son to dwell with us. We look back on the events of Christmas and Easter when we meditate on the life, death, and resurrection of that redeemer who dwelled with us. And we meditate on Pentecost when the helper sent by the Father and Son comes to dwell with us. So when we look back on the new data that we've seen in the person of Christ, the image of the invisible God, and see how God is Father, Son, and Spirit, we can understand that, okay, maybe the Trinity is a thing, but we still don't understand how the logic works out because we can't understand the Trinity. It's not a maximum to be explained. Instead, it's a mystery to be experienced. So Karl Barth, who was a German theologian in the 20th century, he said this about the Trinity. He said, the triunity of God is the secret to his beauty. If we deny this, we at once have a God without radiance and without joy and without humor, a God without beauty. Karl Barth says that the Trinity is the secret to God's beauty, but for lots of us, perhaps, when we think of the tr Trinity, we think of the Trinity as being more boring than beautiful. We don't think of the Trinity as being good news. So that leaves the question, how do we experience this mystery? How do we experience the mystery of the Trinity in a way that is good news for our souls? And to explore that, I want us to look at the last few verses of the Romans passage that we looked at, uh, verses 14 to 17 in Romans chapter 8. And this is just one way in which we can experience the beauty of the Trinity. Every part of the Christian life is touched by the Trinity, but this is how we see it in one way. So since the fifth chapter of Romans, Paul has been sussing out exactly what the good news of the gospel means for, for us as Christians. And in chapter eight, he arrives at how the gospel can provide people assurance in all circumstances. And in these four verses that we're about to look at, he develops that specifically through the idea of adoption, of becoming children of God. 
In fact, in these four verses, in the English, we see f uh, words relating to the idea of family ten times. We can read in the first two verses some of these words. In verses 14 and 15, he says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Paul says the spirit makes us sons, effectively sealing our adoption as God's children. As a quick aside, Paul uses the word sons not to indicate that women can't inherit this promise, but because in the Roman day, sons would have had different and distinct more rights than daughters would have. So Paul uses the word sons here, not to say this promise is not available to males and females, but to emphasize that in fact all of us receive these additional rights as sons. There's not a distinction here based upon being a son or a being a son or a, a daughter. We all receive the rights of sons, whether we're uh, male or female. But what are those rights that we receive? What are we adopted into? We are adopted into the inner life of God. In John 17, Jesus says that th the Father loved him from before the foundation of the world. Before anything else existed, love did because God existed. God the Father was loving God the Son. And the Father delighted to pour his spirit out on the Son and love him. And the Son received this love and returned it to the glory of the Father. And the Spirit was constantly glorifying and giving love to both the Father and to the Son. God and his eternal being, even before anything else was made, was caught up in this eternal dance of love. And that can't be true if God is not triune. If God is just one, he couldn't have been loving anything before the world was made. But because God is three in one, God is love, and love is at the heart of the universe. So much so that because God is always looking out to someone else, the Father was looking to the Son, the Son to the Father, and the Spirit to both of them, because God was loving and outward facing, it was natural for him to create the universe. Not because God had to, he already had perfect love, because he wanted to invite others into this dance of love that he experienced as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each week in the Eucharist, we say that God has made us for himself. And this is what we mean by that, that we were made to experience this love of God, to be drawn into this loving dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that has been going on since before the beginning of time. This perfect love is what we've been adopted into. But the fact that we've been adopted into it suggests that we were outside of it. It suggests that we had been estranged, that something went wrong. And this is what Paul details in the first three chapters of Romans. He says that we exchanged partaking in this perfect, eternal communion with God and decided to look for the needs of our heart elsewhere. And that is exactly what Adam and Eve did when they thought they needed something over and above walking with God and the perfect relationship of love in the garden. And that's what we all do when we look for love in the wrong places. And so as a result of us looking elsewhere, though God is still perfectly love in and of himself, by turning away from him and his love, we no longer receive his love in the same way. Indeed, before this section of Romans, Paul has been referring to humanity not with the language of sons or daughters or children or family, but with language like enemies and fools and condemned. To put it lightly, we were left on the outside looking in, unable to return to what we had willingly left. We had been cut off from the love behind the universe. But because God is triune, because God is three in one, always looking to give love outside of himself, always looking outward, he loved us even when we were on the outside. 
he loved us when we were as other as we could possibly be. And because we could not re-enter into this inner life of love, because we could not re-enter into this perfect dance of Father, Son, and Spirit, Jesus entered our life of brokenness, our life of misplaced love, our life of despair. Though he was God, he became part of our human family that we might become members of the household of God. And he took on the separation that we deserved so that we could know union with God. And if this is where the Trinity starts to really get good. If we truly have been grafted through Jesus into the family of God, through this adoption that Paul is talking about, it might seem too good to be true sometimes. You might think, surely God has made a mistake. He can't actually love me. Doesn't he know who I really am or the things that I've done? Or maybe you might think, other people have treated me so poorly in my whole life, I don't deserve love. I don't think I deserve this love that God has on offer. And even after we've trusted in Jesus and been made sons and daughters of God, it's easy for us to feel like this sometimes. And so what does God do? We read about it in verse 16. He gives us the gift of his spirit, which dwells inside of us and testifies to the fact that we are children of God. So if you have a hard time believing that you are in fact a beloved son or daughter of God, ask your heavenly father to pour out his fatherly love into your heart through his Holy Spirit. And in verse 15, we see what effect that creates in us. It makes our hearts cry, Abba, Father. Paul makes a really specific word choice there. He could have just said Father, but no, he says Abba, Father. Why does he say Abba? He says Abba because that was the language that Jesus used to address the Father in his most intimate moments of prayer with God. When he was praying in the garden before his crucifixion, he cried out to God, Abba, Father. And because of the Holy Spirit that testifies to our hearts that we are in fact his children, we can join with him in that cry. We can have that same kind of access and relationship with God that Jesus has. In our reading from Exodus, Moses had to stay far away. But because of the work of the Son and the Spirit in our hearts, we can draw confidently before the throne of grace, as Hebrews says. We can have the same view and relationship with God that the Son has. Here's an example of what that looks like and how that's important. So David and Caitlin are my brother and sister-in-law, and Caitlin's parents live very close to them. And when I stayed with David and Caitlin, I got to get to know them some, and they would have us over for dinner. And I remember one time I went over for dinner with them, and their names are Roger and Barbara. And at this point, I had heard about them a lot more than I had actually spent time with them. So I had heard how Caitlin would refer to her mom and dad as Babs and Raj. And because I'm a pastor of sorts, when they had me over, they asked me to bless the meal. And as part of that blessing, I thanked God for Raj and Babs's hospitality. And they chuckled. Caitlin and her sisters and Roger and Barbara laughed because I didn't have the intimacy that Caitlin does to call them that. I didn't have that right. I hadn't yet built that up yet. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit being poured out into our hearts, we can refer to the Father as Abba. We can call God Father, and God doesn't look at us and laugh. He doesn't chuckle. He's eager to hear our prayers because of the work of the Son and the Spirit. In fact, God does not look down and laugh at us when we pray to him and call him Father. He does something much more beautiful than that. He sees us as his children. So there's a meme on the internet that goes something like this. It says, find someone who looks at you the way this person or thing looks at that person or thing. 
One iteration of this is a picture of a cute dog who's looking longingly at a plate of meat waiting to be barbecued. You can probably imagine that in, in your head. And in this meme, it says, find someone who looks at you the way Roger the dog looks at barbecue. Well, here's the thing. If we are in Christ, if through the work of the Son we've been grafted into this uh, eternal dance of love, and if the Spirit testifies to our hearts to help us know in our bones that we are in fact his children, his sons and daughters, then when God sees us, he sees us in the same way he sees Jesus. He looks at us in the same way the Father looks at the Son. So if you are ever like, man, I don't know if God can actually love me. Because of the Trinity, we see how the Father has always loved the Son. And so we have found someone who looks at us the way that the God, the Father looks at God the Son. God looks, us, God looks at us that way. The Bishop of New England, he captures it like this. He draws three circles in a, in a, a triangle and, and labels them Father, Son, and Spirit and has bi-directional arrows of love that connect each one. And then he adds a, a label to this uh, circle that says Son and he says, you are here. In the mystery of the Trinity, we experience the eternal love that the Father, Son, and Spirit have always had for one another. And this wonder of adoption is one way in which we can experience the mystery of the Trinity. It's not the only way, of course, but it's what we have before us in our passage in, in Romans. And when we see how the Trinity works out like that, making us sons and daughters of God, I hope that we can see that the Trinity is not a dead or dry doctrine, but a sucker for sin-sick souls like you and me. Sure, we will always struggle to understand the logic of it, but my prayer for us today is that deep in our bones we can experience the love of the Father as we are in Christ through the Spirit, which makes our hearts cry out to God. And as we grow in grasping this idea, this experience of the Trinity and adoption, we'll find that we will start to show some of the family resemblance. We'll become less turned inward on ourselves and become more like our Heavenly Father turned outwards, turned outwards to others in love. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that you are three in one and one in three. Please pour out your love through your spirit into our hearts that the cry of our hearts to you may be Abba Father and that may we see how you see us just as you see your son because of the work of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen. Please stand. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the prayer book tradition commends the reading of the Athanasian Creed on um, Trinity Sunday. We'll be reading the Creed by half sentence. I'll read up to the asterisk and then you'll complete the sentence. Whosoever will be saved. Which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled. Without doubt, we shall perish everlasting. And the Catholic faith is this that we worship one God in the Trinity, and the Trinity in unity. Neither confounding the persons, nor dividing the substance, 
For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory and majesty of eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son. And such, such is the Holy Ghost. Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate. And the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible. And the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal. And the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. And yet they are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, so likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord, and yet not three lords. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion. The Father is made of none. The Son is of the Father alone. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons. And in this Trinity, none is a four or after other. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together. So that, that in all things, as is aforesaid, he therefore that will be saved. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation. For the right faith is that we believe and confess. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds. Perfect God and perfect man. Equal to the Father as touching his Godhead. Who, although he be God and man, one, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, one altogether, not by confusion of substance, for as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, who suffered for our salvation, he ascended into heaven, he sitteth on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From whence he shall come to the dead. At whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting. This is the Catholic faith. Please kneel for the prayers of the people. Hear our prayer. 
for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. We also pray for those who persecute your people. Forgive them and turn their hearts toward you through the faithful witness of those they persecute. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Wave the peace at everyone around you. Please be seated. I have a few, a few announcements for you. You likely saw some beautiful quilts out on the colonnade as you came into church. They're available for sale as a, uh, a fundraiser for our Camp Araminta Scholarship for those campers who need some assistance in visiting camp, staying at camp, which will be in person this year. Yay. Soaking prayer is this Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. That will be hosted on Zoom this month. Um, the emergency team does want to move that to an in-person meeting at some point. I thank you for your grace and your loving kindness to each other as we make this transition and um, haven't heard a lot of conflict about masks and all of that, so we're just being a community moving through this transition. Also, I want to make uh, congratulations to our high school graduates, Jeremy Griffin and Katie Kirby, and there they are on the screen as they are in the congregation today. So be sure to pass your own congratulations on to them. The scribe of the Lord, the honor do his name, bring offerings and come into his courts. Father, Spirit, and the 
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of substance. For that which we believe of your glory, O Father, we believe the same of your Son and of the Holy Spirit without any difference or inequality. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave, to, gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. 
All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. That takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us, O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let the people come to the Lord's table. Sovereign God, O matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before the throne of grace. To you belongs the highest praise. The suffering. This passing time under your wings I will abide and bury.
like water ever flows. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, clothed in power and in grace. The name above all of
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. All our problems we send, we send to the to cross Christ. of Christ. All our difficulties we send, send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All of our hopes we set on the risen Christ. And now let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God, to God who gives us victory. Our Lord. 